Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm here today representing um, the Farming, Forestry and Rural Land Management Working Group, uh, which is chaired by Carl Cordermans, who gives his apologies. Um, I'm vice chair, along with my colleague Rika Mustanen from Finland. Um, and I guess I would set out by saying, uh, mindful of the fact that I'm being recorded, um, I work for Historic England, which uh, is the English Heritage Agency for the UK government, if you like. And I'll say a little more about that now uh, in due course. And, uh, <laughs> these large corporations. You, you could actually mention that this whole session or this uh, roundtable goes back to John Humble's and Carl Hordeman's idea to have a, uh, a roundtable like this in, uh, in Glasgow, which then never happened because uh, John died. Uh, or was ill already too ill to come to Glasgow? Yes, unfortunately. So we're actually yeah. taking up your idea. So, so this is something, um, yeah, absolutely correct, that um, John Humble, who worked in my team, and Carl cooked up amongst themselves a couple of years ago, um, and this impartial, um, partially is in memory of John. Um, and John had been working on these issues for uh, over a decade, and... Let me just give you some of the background then to the work of the working group. Um, and I want to cover three areas. One is to talk about the background itself and what the issues were, why we were formulated. Um, I want to give you examples of how we've tried to address the issues themselves. And then I want to finish off by giving you some observations on the obstacles, the opportunities and possible, possible future directions uh, for the working group, but also for EAA when it tries to address these wider issues. The working group itself uh, began in 2004. It currently has 48 members, some of whom are more active than others, but 48 corresponding, corresponding members from 17 countries. <coughs> Unfortunately, it's uh, well rather sort of limited to Central and Northwestern Europe. And if you know of any colleagues who might be interested, then please uh, pass on the invitation. But it was formulated in 2004, and then in 2009, it was um, adopted as a working group of the European Archaeological Council as well. So we've tried, we, we started collaboration, wider collaboration, early on, if you like. And why did this begin in 2004? Really, it coincided with the first empirical evidence, if you like, gathered by uh, heritage agencies across Europe of the damage that was being done uh, to rural heritage and archaeology. And to give you some very quick examples, here are the stats from Norway. And the biggest cause uh, of dereliction loss and decay to archaeology was agriculture, 53%. Looking at the Republic of Ireland, land improvement, uh, that euphemism, basically that's the conversion of uh, bog moorland uh, for productive agriculture, if you like, for grazing. So 62% of sites being affected by that. The Netherlands, again, you can read the stats for yourselves here, but we're talking about cultivation principally, uh, largely responsible for the loss of archaeology. And when you move away from the empirical and move towards the anecdotal, we also had evidence from other countries, and here's an example from Italy, of the extent to which modern agricultural practices were day on day destroying archaeological sites. Um, and one of the key issues that was affecting the whole of Europe, it seemed, was the conversion of permanent pasture to arable cultivation. And you can see the statistics for yourselves. But it's important to understand, of course, that as far as Europe's concerned, outside the archaeological community, um, as long as we have the same area of permanent pa of pasture, if you like, that, that's okay. What they don't generally get is the fact that when you move areas of pasture around, that leads to the destruction of archaeology. And to give you an example from England, this is a place called Little Padbury in the English Midlands. This was it in 1950. And what you can see there, the corrugated medieval ridge and furrow uh, landscapes with 19th century 
field boundaries across the top of it. That was it in 1950. And we'll morph into, well, 2003. And what we're seeing there is not just the loss of the archaeology itself, if you like, but you're seeing the entire landscape changing, the field boundaries going. And many of the things which are distinctive about that landscape have disappeared in the last 50 years. Um, it's not an isolated example. It's happening across Europe. It continues to happen across Europe. Local, local distinctiveness is being lost. But we're seeing things like this, and this is the east of England. Um, it could well be Mars, looking at the slide, except for the tree. I don't think they have trees on Mars. But really, if you were to look at this landscape before World War II, you would see a patchwork quilt of small field systems, some of which would be going back to the Roman or pre-Roman era. And yet in the last 50 years or so, this has been destroyed. So it's an example from England, but this is an issue that is across Europe. Um, and where archaeological sites and pasture have been lost, and I'm reliably informed that this is Denmark, but please tell me if I'm wrong, um, you get um, threats to the surviving archaeology. And here you see a barrow being denuded by sheep uh, because it's the only, well, grazing area within the landscape, if you like. So there are threats too. And the opposite side of the coin, intensification, has caused uh, the loss of landscape features, if you like. But in other areas, notably the uplands, and here's another example from England, or rather from Cornwall, in the southwest of the UK. Um, this is on Bodmin Moor, and this is a protected, you can't really see with the lighting, but um, this is a protected archaeological site. This is a Bronze Age enclosure, and the dots on there are Bronze Age uh, huts, hut circles. Um, and at the left hand side, you can just move them out. I don't, I don't think it'll help, it's just the blocking. But you can see the enclosures there. You can't see them at all on the right hand side. And that's because of scrub growth. So, what we're seeing there is a lack of day to day management. So, on the one hand, intensification. On the other, in the upland and more marginal areas, abandonment. And again, that's a pan European problem. And the third and final one is woodland and forestry. Um, if you were to ask a member of the public in England, do we have more or less trees now than we did 100 years ago, they would invariably say we have fewer trees. But the fact is it's the opposite. We have more woodland in England than we've had for a considerable amount of time. Um, and the problem with forestry is that we're getting successive new plantations, increasing areas taking up, and again this is across Europe, with little thought to the impacts on the archaeology. Um, and you can see an example here. This is the uplands of the UK. Huge forestry plantation trenches across the moorland landscapes. Um, again, this is from the UK. The other issue is, though, where we have existing forestry plantations, there's been little archaeological prospection. LIDAR starting to change things like that now. But because the archaeology is largely unknown in, within existing forestry, when it comes to successive uh, cycles of felling um, and removal of the timber, the archaeology can be damaged that way too. So again, these are pan-European problems. Um, but if I were to try and characterise it, what we're talking about here is dereliction and loss, uh, which is without mitigation because the polluter pays principle is not invoked at all. This is entirely different to the planning system. Um, so that's really why the working group was put together. This is um, an ongoing issue across Europe. So how have we tried to respond? Well, it's important to understand <coughs> that the situation, again, across Europe um, is identical if you work within a heritage agency. And this is a slightly outdated example, but from England. Um, at the bottom here, we have Historic England, who I work for. We report to the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, um, and they report to the EU Culture and, and Education Directorate General. But the issues we've been talking about actually are addressed by the EU Environment Directorate General, um, who, if you follow it down through the Agriculture uh, Ministry on the right there, DEFRA, down to the agencies responsible for the natural <laughs> environment, 
So the, the natural environment sector and the heritage sector are split at a European level and domestically. And if we want to address the kind of issues we're talking about, we, we have to try and draw the two together. So there is a political problem. What we've tried to do is to build that evidence base at a European level. We've tried to disseminate the evidence um, of the scale of damage, loss, the threats, and the possible solutions. Um, and we started by doing this EAC occasional paper. Uh, this was from 2010, uh, I think. <coughs> but we've also talked to various um, organisations across Europe, the European Landowners Organisation, for instance, um, about why heritage in the context of landscape is important for them. And I'll speed up considerably now. <laughs> now, all of this, you might think, well, you know, what difference does it make? The fact is, by talking to different agencies and organisations, members' organisations across Europe, uh, we managed to get these markers within European um, legislation, if you like. Article 5, Union Priorities for Rural Development. There's a hook there. It talks about the state of European landscapes. And similarly, in the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development, having written, I didn't because heritage agencies are pro prohibited from doing so, but members of the working group did, wrote to their MEPs, and we also have these markers down for re restoration and upgrading of cultural heritage and cultural landscapes. And again, this, this marker down here for landscape and its features. As a result of that, within England, um, forget the stats if you like, the important thing for me from a heritage agency point of view is that between 2005 and 2024, we have got from the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development, £280 million committed towards the preservation and protection of archaeology. So that was uh, the first two stages, giving you examples, and um, examples of the threats too. Finally, I'll give you uh, my, my take on the obstacles. Since 2003, money has become, uh, 2008, money has become incredibly tight. Governments are taking a more fundamentalist approach to policy, which means that people working for heritage agencies like myself are not allowed to do policy. We don't speak for the government, we merely advise them. So it's an important uh, distinction to take on, on board. Increasingly, heritage is seen as a nice to have, but at worst a financial burden. Why should we protect archaeology? Actually, that's just added expense. And I have to say that it's exas exacerbated by the lack of heritage directives. Now, we could debate whether it's necessary to have a heritage directive or not. There are plenty relating to the natural environment. But what I can say is that at the level of a member state, it's perceived that heritage, because of the lack of directives, is less important. If we want to influence change, uh, we need to market the opportunities for cultural heritage. Um, this sentence here, I'm afraid I wrote when I drank a beer, but um, when I talk about it transcends its intrinsic importance, when we're talking to people, we understand the importance of archaeological heritage, but we have to remember that they aren't heritage professionals. And we have to show them examples of how, for instance, those field boundaries, which could date back to the Bronze Age, actually are habitats too and they present nutrients leaking into water courses, etc., etc. We have to sell the multiple benefits. We have to act as mediators for non-heritage professionals, and we must, above all, <coughs> never thump the table and demand archaeology should be protected. We have to show them the way. Using a quote from the uh, guru for Formula One, Bernie Eccleston, whose uh, every word I listen to, uh, negotiation is the art of the possible. So we have to show them if there's a problem, what the solution is to. And to finish, possible audiences. Well, I don't have time to go in this in depth. I'm sure you can think of many more. But actually, for me, it starts at the level of the European Parliament and Council of Europe. But there is, going down to the bottom there, an awful lot that we could do at the level of uh, better integration and collaboration between the working groups themselves. So thank you. Thank you.